Okay. Good morning. My name is Carrie Pillay, and we are going to be talking, I'm going to be talking about emotionally healthy families. Emotionally healthy families. This is one of my favorite topics because I find that a lot of us uh, have been raised. <laughs> We may have been raised in healthy ways. Some of what our parents did was good and some of what our parents did maybe wasn't so good. It's what we know because our jobs as parents are to raise our children and to mentor them. And we learn what we see and what was applied to us, okay? It doesn't always mean that we're doing things in our best interest and some of what we're doing based upon how we were raised isn't working, okay? So when we talk about emotionally healthy families, this is designed to give you some ideas about a range of what healthy looks like so that you kind of have something to compare what you're doing to and maybe what you were raised to to know am I in range or are there are some things that I really could change to do a better job so that's what I'm going to spend the next little bit talking about okay I'm going to define what we call healthy we're going to look at the characteristics of it and in front of you you should have a sheet and I like to do the fill-ins for this one so that you get a chance to think about it and write it down because I find that we remember and maybe process a little bit better with that. So you should all have one of those in front of you. And we're going to look at those characteristics, okay? So let's start with what my definition of an emotional healthy family is. Any family that problem solves sufficiently well enough to allow each member to meet their potential or goals. That's my definition of an emotionally healthy family. That definition of an emotionally healthy family, and you'll hear me interchange that with normal. <laughs> normal. <laughs> uh, people say, is there such a thing as a normal family? And mo some people will say yes, because they think they were raised normal, and other people will say no, because they know they weren't. I use those words interchangeably, but I'm trying to get to the emotionally healthy family instead of that idea of normal. Because there's a range to this. That definition, though, is a big definition, isn't it? To be in an emotionally healthy family, we have to have the ability as a family to problem solve. We have to know as a family what the goals and potential are of the members of the family. Because this isn't about a group being successful, this is about the members meeting their goals and potential. So I got to know what the potential is for myself, for my partner, for the children that are a member of this family, and as a family we are supporting solving the problems that are associated with us meeting our goals and potential. That's big. That's big. And most of us have not considered looking at families in, in our, at our family in that manner. And we struggle with, well, what the heck am I supposed to do? And how do I deal with this? And ah, we hit overwhelm at times. I'm going to help you break this down. Because when we look at how do we get to that emotionally healthy family, there are characteristics, things that we need to think about, know, and perhaps start, change, implement, whatever in, in our families so that they work in a more healthy way. Okay. The basic characteristics, and I'll go through them, but re understand we're going to talk about each one of these. That's what this class is. We're going to talk about these characteristics. The first one is the four R's. Roles, rules, rituals, and routines. And I'm going to tell you right up front, if you can get those four things in order, where you understand and know what you need to do, you are 90% on your way to being in a healthy family. Getting those in order. Values are important. Boundaries in a family are important. Being aware of what the individual rights are to the family members are important. Quality time, huge. A lot of us don't know what that is and we spend more time managing children than spending quality time with them. And we have to have an awareness and a commitment to start doing more of that. Having some balance in the family. And when we talk about that, I'll tell you what it is. Being able to problem solve. We already, I've already told you that one's important. And we're going to look at what some of that looks like. So let's start with those four R's. The first one are the roles that we have in a family. And the roles that we have, in my mind, are like the hats that I wear. Who am I and who am I dealing with? Okay. So I have a role in a family as a female, as the partner to my spouse, wife in my case, some of us would be a girlfriend or if we're not, if we're not married, 
partner is a generic term for that, but I have that role in my family, don't I? Because that's who I am in that family that we're in. I have my role as a parent to my children in the family. I have a role as a step parent to the children that are in this family that are not biologically mine. And that's a different role than being a parent. <laughs> it is. You find that out as a step parent when this child that isn't biologically yours looks at you and says, you're not my mom or you're not my dad. And they clue you in that you are not and I'm, it should tell you I'm in the wrong role. Okay. We have the role as a mentor as a parent. Our parenting role gets bigger. We have a role as a mentor. We teach our children. We have the hands-on to show them how they should live and what is expected in this family that we're in. That's my job. I have the role as a disciplinarian. So I'm, the, I'm as a parent, responsible for correction of behaviors that aren't working. Right? Yeah, that's right. I, do I have a role as friend when I'm a parent? Yeah, not really. I'm glad to see heads shake no. I cannot be a friend to my child as their parent. Can I be friendly? Yes. Can I be, can I have unconditional positive regard for them? Love them unconditionally? Yes, absolutely. I think that's a mandate too. I shouldn't be my child's friend though. Not in the way that we have friends with other people because that's going to get me in trouble. If I go out and party with my 15 year old, then when I look at my 15 year old and try to say you can't do that, my 15 year old is going to put their hands on their hips and say, but you and I have already done this. Now I'm in trouble. I'm your mom. I'm your parent. I'm not your friend. There are things I can't do with my child because I can't be their friend that way. That's an inappropriate role. Okay. So our role as parent requires us to know what we need to be doing. Okay. And those are some of the things that fit under that role. Um, we have a role, um, we have other roles in life and th the reason I'm going to talk about this is because I find we do have some role confusion that goes on. Sometimes I forget who I'm, who I'm with and what I should be to that individual, okay? Let me give you an example. We were just talking about f being friends with our children. That's an inappropriate role as a parent, okay? How many of you have ever parented your partner? If you're a woman, have you ever mothered your partner? Oh, sweetie, you know, let me fix the boo-boo. If you're a male, have you ever fathered your partner? We do. It's an inappropriate role. I, in, a, in a healthy relationship, in a healthy family, we are aware of who we are. And in my mind, to be in a healthy family, we as the parents, the leadership in the family, you're going to hear me use that word now for the first time, because we decided to form this family, you and I. This family is here because you and I decided to be a couple and we decided to have this family and we are responsible for leading and organizing and taking, and, and taking this family forward in healthy ways. Okay? And, as, and as leaders in a family, we need to be equals, which means we need to have shared decision making. We need to be on board with how things are going to be laid out and who's going to be responsible for what, but we have to come to that agreement. That is one of our roles, and when we get to rules and responsibilities, one of the responsibilities we have as the forming couple for the family. Hmm. So in my mind, our role as leader of the family, male and female, should be equal. Okay? Second R, rules. Rules in families are important. <laughs> we, we, they help us to organize. They help us to know who's supposed to do what. They help us to be able to hold people accountable. When they're doing their job, we can, we can praise them and we can reward them. And when they're not doing what they should be doing, it helps us to be able to correct, right? To correct. So we need this as a method of organizing and as regulating, okay? Rules in a family help to establish hierarchy. When I was talking about role, the role of leadership in the family, I'm already heading into what are the rules because we as the parents are the ones that set the rules in the family. We are the ones that need to be telling the children what they're responsible to do. We have to look at ourselves though. This is where the, the, we can't have a hierarchy between you and me as we lead, but we have to have an agreement about who's responsible to do what. Otherwise, you and I are going to have some arguments, right? 
I don't, I am not invested in how you lay it out. I'm invested in that we agree. So it doesn't matter to me if you say, you know what, my career field has a better income ability than yours. And so we agree that I'll be the one that goes out and works full time because that gives us more financial ability to, to live life we want. And as, and I'm a female and I'm talking from that perspective and I'm doing that on purpose. And so I look at my partner who's male and, I, and he agrees that he's going to be the one that's more doing the things at home. He may be responsible to pick the children up or to be with them when they're sick or to do the PTA meetings because as I work outside the home, this is less available. This is a role reversal we're seeing going on. It doesn't matter how we set it up as long as you and I agree. We're both going to work outside the home and we're both going to fix dinner and we're both going to make sure the laundry gets done and we're both going to be responsible for homework. Do you get where I'm going with this? We have to lay out the rules to know who's responsible to do what. Because when something isn't working quite right, we know where the responsibility lies, who's supposed to be doing it, and then we can check it out. Now we're talking about problem solving, aren't we? What's going on that this isn't happening? We, we need to go back and look at this because it's not working like we thought it was going to work when we laid it out, when we thought that this would be a working thing. So rules help to establish hierarchy. There is a hierarchy between parents and children. Children are not your equals. <laughs> they shouldn't be the ones leading the family. We should be the ones leading the family. They need to be mentored and directed from us and they have to learn how to live in a family. That's part of what rules are about, learning how to live among others. And it starts with the family. The two children, the three children, the stepchildren, the extended family as we get older, we have sometimes parents come back and live with us too. So we're starting to see multi-generations as a part of families again. Okay? We may have a roommate because I can't live on my own. You hear me not defining who's in the family, but rather what we define as our family. So I may not be able to live on my own and it's me and my roommate and her two kids and my two kids. And that's a family. Because we have to share space, we have to have the rules, this is how it's going. So we have to identify in our minds who's in our family. The leaders in the family are the ones that establish the rules. They have the hierarchical position. They have the final say in what goes and what isn't going to work and what is going to work and how they want it to be. Okay. Having rules in the family also help to set limits. They also help to set limits. Okay. So when a rule is, you know, we don't watch TV or we don't get to play on the gaming system until the chores are done and after dinner, that's setting a limit, isn't it? So that we don't just have this goo and people aren't just sitting around or running around doing whatever they want. There's some structure for here are the things that have to be done and here's, here's in this case, a reward for once things are done, here's what that can look like. Rules also have a range. And when we talk about our parenting styles, this is where that range comes in because some of us really do like more structure. I'm much more comfortable with rules and for people to know what I expect and how, thing, how I want them to be than for things to be light and fluffy. That's me personally. Light and fluffy people in my mind don't have a lot of rules and they kind of go with the flow and they tend to be a little more spontaneous and we're going to see what happens. And so if I'm a permissive, that's permissive over there, if I'm a permissive person, I don't have a set dinner time. We just kind of get home and we see how everybody's doing and we open the refrigerator and we see what's there and we make dinner from there. <laughs> That's more that permissive. There's not a lot of structure there. And for, some, for some families that works. That third style is that democratic style. And I find even with democratic families they tend to have a little bit more either an autocratic kind of a tendency or a permissive kind of a tendency. But that democratic is really about teaching children how to live having enough established that things, that there is some responsibility assigned, that we do have some limits, that we're, that we're establishing things so that we can function in ways that allow us to problem solve, okay? The other thing about rules is that we have to be, we have to have some flexibility there because over time, life changes. Over time, life changes. Think about the first job you ever had you were probably making minimum wage unless you were waitressing and then you were making less in tips, <laughs> right? And as we move on through life, we tend, to, we tend to get better jobs, right? And we may be working different hours. You know, I started out in nursing and, and I was a nurse's aide and I worked night shift 
and weekends and holidays. I started out that whole thing. Okay, well, I don't do that anymore, <laughs> which changes the way life needs to look for me. When you think about that first job and where you were and what you needed to be doing, life looked very different there than it does for you today because life moves on. We all tend to be at a different place. Same thing happens with children as they grow. You know, you don't have to change diapers forever, thank goodness. They grow out of that and learn to use the potty. If you, if you still have those, it's coming. They learn to use the potty and the diapers go away. As they go to school, as they go to, to school, pre-K and kindergarten and grade school, now they have a period where they're learning with other people. And now you have six hours that if you're working, you know, you, you're not paying for daycare anymore. You have other things that come though. Now I have to check homework in the evenings, right? So things are always changing. Rules have to change too as the family matures. You know, a 16 year old doesn't need 12 hours of sleep. So if you're trying to tell your 16 year old they need to go to bed at seven because they got to get up by seven the next morning, they're going to look at you and scratch their head and think you're totally out of your mind. And if you're still at 12 hours for a 16 year old, and they're challenging you about 12 hours of sleep, really? You, that's one of those things I may have to rethink. Perhaps I'm a little behind and haven't really looked at where we're at and what the needs are for this person. And there again, as the leadership of the family, when one of the members comes and says, hey, I want you to think about or I'm asking for a change, it's my job to hear them and to consider whether this is really needed and to make a final decision. And we as parents are the ones to make that final decision. For 16 year olds, I probably need to tell them why. Why I made the change or why I didn't make the change or why I'm willing to do something between where you are and what you would like because it's part of their learning process. So we have to be flexible and willing to hear from the members over time as things change. That may be my partner too who says, you know what, I have this great job opportunity in Memphis or in Tampa. So we have to look at, okay, what are the possibilities there? And as a couple, as a family, make a decision about it. Is this going to be best for the members of the family? Okay. We do that as the leadership. We do that with all of the members in the family because that's about meeting the, those goals and potential, isn't it? So the first two, roles and rules, these are big. We can start to get a handle on these and know what we want and why we want it and lay it out. For the other family members, if you don't have a lot of this going on, you're going to have to have that family meeting to explain what we're doing. Okay, I know this is a, t this is a change, but here's what we're thinking about, and here's why we're thinking about it, and here's what I'm going to ask you to do, and then you have to toe the line because you're making a change. Now I have to reward for, for doing what I ask, and I have to correct when you're not quite getting it, right? Number three. Rituals. Okay. Rituals are the fun part of being in a family. Rituals are the things that families cherish, the special events, the way that we celebrate. This is where families get an identity. This is what makes people feel like their family is special. Okay. You probably had some of those growing up because that's where I kind of pulled mine from initially. We just came through the holiday season and my family was very large when I was growing up and our ritual at Christmas was we would go to one grandma's house on Christmas Eve and we'd open gifts and we'd go to the other grandma's house on Christmas afternoon and we'd open gifts. So I had two dinners and we all looked forward to that. We knew at Christmas time that this was coming. Okay? And it was expected and we, my, in my case my families enjoyed each other. I meet some families who and that's not such a good thing. Maybe we need to change the ritual. <laughs> Other rituals, how do you celebrate birthdays? How do you celebrate anniversaries? How do you celebrate accomplishments? You know, when your child, my, ch my children are in Taekwondo, when they get that next stripe on their belt, how do you celebrate that? Because they did work for that, right? Yeah, yeah, so what are the special things? This can change too over time as kids get bigger and they're doing new things we have to celebrate. What about when we're, we're establishing a new family? My first family didn't work out. You and I didn't stay together. And we got two children, you and I. And you move on and you move into a new relationship and I move on and into a new relationship and in my new relationship my other partner has one child and I've got my two. That's a new family, isn't it? That is a new family and how many rituals does this new family have? Zero. Their first year they have zero rituals because they haven't lived through any of them yet. So as a family, we have to decide how are we going to celebrate 
birthdays and anniversaries and what's going to be significant for us and when we're in a blended family we have to consider what about when you're not with me on the birthday <laughs> how do I do that one and what if you're not here for Christmas when do we do that so we have to think about what is this going to look like what are the rituals how do we establish an identity so the members understand what it is to be in the Jones family why are we different than the Smiths that live next door and the Hernandezes that live two houses down and all of the kids that they go to school with? If we don't think about it, we won't be. We'll be living in the goo. Okay? But part of the fun, part of the fun of being in a family are the things that set us apart. They are the things that we look forward to. They are the things that are different about us. And as leadership, we should be capturing those and showing our members what those are about so that they understand who they are and where they come from. The last are our routines. Okay? Routines are the day-to-day -day stuff, the day-to-day -day events that have to be performed in order for the family to function. Okay? So this is the daily living stuff. How do we get up in the morning? How do we get breakfast? How do we get out the door to go to school, to go to work, to do whatever? How do we get dinner done in the evening? How do we get ready for bed? How does the garbage get out? This is the implementation of the rules and the responsibilities. And then how do we actually get the family taken care of and get the things done that have to be done? Okay, this is the less fun part. But if we don't do this well, guess what? Again, a lot of frustration. <laughs> We're not having fun as a family. We don't, we, don't, we don't focus on the rules because we haven't bothered or aren't doing a good job of implementing the routines. This is where we as parents, again, have to get out our who's responsible for what and how am I going to make sure that the children are doing this. And when they are doing it and I need to reward them for something new, how do I do that? If they're slipping a little bit, how do I course correct to get them doing what I need them doing? Got to stay on top of it as a parent. Got to stay on top of it. Okay, so I have some examples here. Talked about the maintenance, but you know, how do you do the grocery shopping? Okay, my mom used to do it for us. If you talk to my, my husband, his family went on Saturdays. It was like an event. They would go to the grocery store on Saturdays and do all of their shopping. Okay, how do you get the bills paid? Okay, how do you get the, the home repairs done? How do you get the house cleaned? How do you get the lawn taken care of? How do you maintain your vehicle? How do you get to the doctor? How do you get the kids to the doctor? All of that is about daily living, isn't it? Not, a, not all of it happens every day. Some of it happens months apart, but it's all part of needing of that maintenance and the stuff that has to happen for us to go, to go on. So that's the four R's. Roles, rules, rituals, routines. Now, as we've talked about those, and I think you can probably see, if you start working on those areas, I know who I am, I know who I'm with, I know what I'm supposed to be doing with that person. We've laid out the rules and the responsibilities, and everybody knows who's supposed to be doing what. Then I got to check to make sure they are, because I'm the leadership. I got to check to make sure that the things that are supposed to be getting done are actually getting done. And if they're having issues, I may have to relook at that, because maybe there's a problem there that needs to be fixed. If they're not having issues, they just don't want to do it, then I'm going to have to get out my, some kind of a, of a consequence, positive or negative, to make sure that that starts happening, right? See how this works? It requires that we are always engaged, though, with what's going on. How do we implement rituals? Well, there we got to know. I have a calendar, and I work, I work hard on what's coming up and how far out do I need to plan Okay, how am I going to do that? How do I make it special? You know, a surprise birthday party can't be planned the day before. <laughs> That's got to be pushed back a little bit. Okay, but if you start thinking about and getting those things in order, you will clear up a lot of the discord, the arguments, the frustration that's going on in the family. Okay, when, you, when the kids come back home, you got to know what you expect from them. And I fully expect the family meeting to happen as you lay out, here's what's got to happen. Because the, when they're in somebody else's care, they're living by somebody else's rules, who may be more permissive or more 
rule structured than you are. Coming into a new family, which is about coming back home, I have to establish what the rules are here. I have to lay out my expectations to the kids so that they know, and then I got to start enforcing them, positive or negative consequences to get them in line to here's how we live here. Okay, next level up. The next thing on the list are values. Values. And you may say, gosh, values. That's your central belief system. And that one, values are actually above the rules that you've laid out because as you set rules out for, your, for the family, they are flowing from how you believe life should be lived. They're flowing from your values, whether you've taken the time to step back and identify what your values are or not. The rules that you're putting in place are a reflection of how you believe life should be lived. Okay, Values are a reflection of the family standard. The leadership's got to do this. The leadership is the one that has the values because your brain is developed enough to have them. Children do not internalize values for themselves until they are in their mid to late teens. 15 to 18 is when the brain is developed enough that I can say, this is how I think I should live and I begin to live the way I think I should live. Prior to that, I am living by other people's rules. School rules, social rules, mom and dad's rules, grandma and grandpa's rules, <laughs> whoever. But I'm living by how other people tell me I gotta live. When we internalize and begin to develop values, now I'm going to live the way I believe I need to live. Okay? Um, when we talk about values, the golden rule is actually a value. I will treat others the way I want to be treated is a value. That is about how I believe I should live among others. I'm going to treat others the way I want to be treated because I think that's right. Okay? And if that's my value, then if you would watch me living life, watch me living life, you should see that I treat others, I consistently treat others the way I want to be treated, whether or not they treat me that way back. Did you catch that? Because with that value, I'm going to treat you the way I want to be treated. The other value is this one. I will treat others the way they treat me. And if that's my value, <laughs> I have, no, 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 <laughs> some of us didn't like that one. <laughs> if that's my value, then as you watch me living my life, when you see somebody yelling and screaming at me, what do you think I'm going to do back? Yell and scream back. I am going to treat you the way you treat me. So if I don't think you're treating me well, I'm not going to treat you well either. That's that value. I will do what it takes to get what I want is a value. Is it a good one or a bad one? Depends what you see, doesn't it? Because potentially it could be good if I'm a motivated person that's going to do what it takes to get what I want and I want to be able to do something for others and it requires that I go to school, then you would say that's a good value. If I'm going to do what it takes to get what I want though and I'm okay with taking something that's yours from you, that's called stealing, then you wouldn't necessarily say that's a good value, would you? Okay? Values are about how we choose to live among others. They can be good, they can be bad. We as the leadership are the ones that are showing the values to the children, to the other family members by the rules that we're putting out, by the way that we're setting up the family and showing others how to live among us. If you haven't stopped to think about what your values are, you can start by looking at the rules you've put in place. You know, one rule, do whatever you want. Do, you can do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt others. Would I expect to see very many rules in that family? Probably not. You can do whatever you want, as long as you don't affect others. Next on the list, boundaries. Boundaries. In a family, there are multiple kinds of boundaries that are there. There are emotional boundaries. There are emotional boundaries that have to do with your right to feel the way that you feel, your what right to be treated, treated respectfully, to be loved unconditionally. Okay? There are physical boundaries. These are easy for us. 
Physical boundaries are about the structure. You know, in our homes, we have walls and doors, don't we? Those are physical boundaries. We have an outer one. Physical boundaries keep other people from just being able to invade our space, don't they? The idea is if my door is shut, my windows are down, you, you know, unless you're invited and I open the door, you shouldn't be in there. Okay? We have boundaries in our own homes, don't we? Because we have rooms. Most of us have boundaries to the bathroom. <laughs> if we live in a studio, we still have a bathroom with a wall and a door. Because <laughs> we want some privacy there. I want to be by myself with that. Okay, we have bedrooms, and that's kind of like personal space. It's my own little boundary, and if the door's shut, for a lot of families, the expectation is if the door's shut, you need to knock or get permission to come in. Don't just come barging in. Those are physical boundaries. Emotional boundaries have to do with how, how people feel as being a member of the family. Spiritual boundaries have to do with the beliefs, some of that values and that higher calling and how do I choose to live life. Okay. Boundaries allow for there to be personal space. Personal space. Being a member of a family doesn't mean you gotta be a clone. You don't have to agree with everybody else in the family. Okay? As a part of a boundary though, I have to have respect for your emotional boundary. And so, you know, the fact that, you know, there are things in life we don't talk about, like politics. And so the fact that you have this political view and I have a different one in the family would be an emotional boundary, wouldn't it? I have to be respectful of you, even if I don't agree. Even if I don't agree. So that would be an example of that. Boundaries can be open or closed. And this is an interesting thing about families, because some of it, I think, has to do with being autocratic and democratic as well. When we have open boundaries, we allow all kinds of information in. All kinds. I mean, we just allow all kinds of information to flow in. And so you think this is a good idea, and you look at this, and we just let it all in. And instead of, as the leadership, making a decision about what fits and what is applicable and what we want to use in this family, we just let it all come in, and it gets gooed up, and we don't make any decisions. In my mind, we get overrun. We get invaded by too much without a decision being made about what fits and what's appropriate and what do we actually want. Okay? Too much information when we have an open boundary that's too open. Closed boundaries are just that. This family has a hard time taking in any new information. Okay? The comments that I hear from closed families are, we don't need any help. We can handle our problems. Don't talk about, don't let anybody outside know. Don't tell anybody about what's going on. We'll figure it out. Those are closed systems. They don't want any new information. They want to believe that they know everything there is to know and have some idea about how to fix that problem. Okay, so they have a hard time taking in any new information. They have a hard time changing. I tend to see that with autocratic families, I think, more than I do with permissive families. Permissive families, I tend to see lots of information and that just go with the flow kind of a thing. When we get to being, we call it semi, semi-open, okay? And this, in my mind, is more balanced. This is, that, this is that family that says, okay, I'm willing to hear new information. I'm willing to think about how it applies and we're gonna make a decision about whether this is something we wanna use implement or if it doesn't apply to us. <coughs> okay? So they're always evaluating, looking at what's coming in for do I need to use this or not. <clears throat> Individual rights. Individual rights. Being a member of a family does not mean that you have to be a clone, that you have to agree with everything in every way with everybody else in the family. That would be pretty boring in my, in my mind. So when we talk about being in a family, you know, there are, there are rights that are there for the individual. You have the right to a different opinion. You have the right to be heard and understood. You have the right to your own belief motivations. Okay? Motivations may have to do with what you believe your potential and some of your goals are. My motivations. Here's where I'm here's where I want to get to. You have the right to be loved unconditionally. 
and you have the right to be treated with respect. Okay? Those first three in my mind, I think most of us get. The bottom two, that unconditional love, is a little bit harder. I think we as adults have learned to condition love and acceptance for lots of people. We have to be careful that we don't condition our love and acceptance for our children, because our children love unconditionally for years. Years. Okay? Unconditional is I love you because of who you are to me. I love you because you're my mom. I love you because you're dad. I love you because you're your Uncle Tim. Okay? I love you for who you are. And it, it isn't conditioned with I'll love you if, I'll love you when. I'm mad at you, so I don't. Those are condi that's conditioned acceptance. Kids love us for who, for who we are. And they may be upset when we don't give them what they want. They love us for who we are. They don't reject that for years. And they reject it because they learn to condition love. Okay, So we need to be accepting and loving of our family members unconditionally. Does that mean we don't correct behavior? No, we do need to correct behavior. That's why it's important that we have some idea about how to correct behavior in ways that are healthy so that we do correct and we do and we do show. You know, I love you. I love you. I am upset about this thing that you did. And we always need to frame it that way. I am upset that you skipped school. I am upset that you didn't take your dinner plate to the sink. I am upset that there are bubbles all over the bathroom. What is it that I'm upset about? It's not about the person. When we start loving, when we start conditioning it, I make, I make it about you instead of the problem. So it really isn't, I won't talk about, it's the bubbles on the floor that I'm upset about. I will be on you as a person. That's conditioned. That's not what we want to do. We need to be focused on why am I upset and how do we get this fixed. The bottom one, to be treated with respect. This one is another one when we're, having, when we're having issues in the family where we're having problems that we don't know how to solve, that we start seeing unrespectful ways, disrespectful ways of dealing with each other. Raising the voice, the silent treatment, glaring, looks, not talking, being sarcastic. Those are all disrespectful means of dealing with someone. Okay. A lot of us understand and we demand that our children respect us as parents, as adults. We'll look at them and say, you have to respect adults. Okay? Do we respect children? If we're not, we should. You know, what is the position your child has in your family that deserves respect? You are my child. I respect you because of who you are to me. You are my child. I, as your parent, need to be showing you what respect looks like. So trust me, they're watching you. Okay, and when you, when you are screaming and yelling at the person that cuts you off in traffic, is that disrespectful or respectful? They will be mocking you from the back seat in two weeks doing the same thing and you'll be going, well, where did they learn that? Hello, look in your rearview mirror because there's the person they learned that from. <laughs> we, they're always looking at us for what am I supposed to do? Okay, we teach them respect. So if they raise their tone and are disrespectful to us, our job is to correct. Excuse me, what, what, what's going on with the tone? What is it that you're upset about? Now I'm looking for the problem. Why are you doing this? Why is this an acceptable way for you to be treating me right now? It requires that I stop. If I just mow through it and want to continue to live life, I'll ignore it or I'll probably be disrespectful in turn, which is not going to help fix this problem, is it? It's tough being a parent. We always have to be aware. In my mind, I think one of the biggest things I've learned is I really have to slow down. The moment I chose to have children was the moment I chose to put the brakes on from going Mach 9. Because it takes time to teach. It takes time to be aware. It takes time to stop even the little things that aren't a big deal today, but if I don't correct it today, in three months, it's going to be out of control. Wow. Okay. Individual rights. You know what isn't on your list? What the individual responsibilities are. So let's go back to look at those rights, because when we look at individual rights, this also tells about our individual responsibilities, doesn't it? Okay. I have to be respectful that others can have a different, a different opinion than mine in a family. 
If I want to be heard and understood, which I'm telling you is right, then I have a responsibility to listen and understand the others. I have a right and I have a responsibility. Okay? If I have a right to my own beliefs and motivations, then the other family members also have a right to their own beliefs and motivations, and I may have to listen and understand. Notice I have not used the word agree. I may not agree. I gotcha. <laughs> we may have to agree to disagree. You and I. When it's a child, you know, we have to find ways to live with the disagreement. And when you and I as adults disagree, we have a chance to model for children what it looks like to peacefully live when we don't always agree on something, when we don't always see eye to eye. Are they going to experience that in life? Absolutely. How do you, how do you, how do, you do that? They're watching. You can show them. Okay? If I want to be loved unconditionally, then I need to love unconditionally. We just talked about what unconditional love was. <coughs> if I want to be treated with respect, then I have a responsibility to be respectful to others. So they go hand in hand. Here's what you have the right to as a member of a family. Here are the responsibilities you have because you have rights in the family. All right, balance. We have to work toward balance, and balance can be kind of tricky, I find. We have to distribute um, the work and play, and the three C's are the, are the work part of that equation. The three C's are careers, children, and chores. Careers, children, and chores. Those take up the majority of our available time, don't they? Yes, they do. Career can be the job, the, pla the, the place where you earn money, the time that you spend away from family. Children are the raising of them, whether you're with them in the evenings, whether you're with them all day. The chores, we're back to those routines. How do we get the stuff done in the family? We spend the majority of our time in life on those three things. So that's the work piece. Where's the play? We've talked about one thing that play can be, and that's some of those rituals, the things that help us to feel special in a family. Quality time is the other place where play can come. And then just having fun. We don't have a lot of time designated for that, a lot of us. Okay? But it's something that we need to be aware of and we need to be working toward if we're not doing it at all. We need to be adding it if we're not doing it at all. We need to be getting some balance in there where we're doing enough of it. If we're, not doing, if we're not doing enough. Balance allows for there to be variety and flexibility, spontaneity, fun. The balance is where, yes, we get things done and we enjoy the family, the members that we're with. It's part of that how we stay connected. Underlying that balance idea is that work is a component of the family, not the central theme. If you're a workaholic, Work is a central theme. Okay? So the workaholic will have a reason why they can't go on vacation, why they can't be at the birthday party, why they can't, because they're not budgeting. They're not giving any time to that play component. They're not, a lot of workaholics aren't giving any time to the other two C's either. They are career focused. I meet uh, nurturers at home who are children focused and they aren't, giving a lot of, they aren't giving a lot of attention to play or to the other C's either, and all of that's out of balance. We need to have a good balance. So if we get back to those four R's and look at this, you know, when I know who I am and what I need to be spending with you for who you are to me, and I know that I gotta spend time with the kids, and we know we gotta have the routines, and we've got the rules set in place, as we start understanding and figuring out how to run this family, we're working to get back in balance. As things are getting done, as we know who's responsible and they're learning to do them, that frees up some time to be able to play. I don't have to focus on it. I don't have to spend every waking moment concerned, worried, frustrated that this stuff isn't going on, because it is. And now when we have free time, now when we've decided to play, now when it is time for this, we can enjoy it. And enjoyment is where the play piece comes in. Quality time. This is a big one. Quality time in families is about 
I call it charging the emotional ba uh, battery. Okay? Routines, you heard me talk about that one, and I wasn't real positive when I talked about it, because I think those can be kind of draining. This is the mundane, the stuff that's got to be done to maintain life. But quality time can be about those rituals. Quality time is about that staying connected. Quality time is about knowing what those goals are, knowing what the potential is. Quality time is about some of that fun. And those tend to be the positive, the positive stuff in the family that helps to rejuvenate, regenerate, makes it a place where you want to be, people that you want to be with. Would that be a good answer for when, when you say what does quality time mean? Would that, would We're working on that. Okay. Quality time. Quality time is about time set, aso set aside for sharing affection. Sharing affection. One of the things that my daughter and I do, and I'd gotten out of the habit of doing it, but it's part of our bedtime routine. We snuggle up in her bed, and we read, we read, a, we read a chapter. She's in chapter books now. So we read a chapter in her book every night. And when she's really tired some nights, she doesn't want to read, and I read. And other, other nights, she wants to read more, so she reads more. And some nights, we're right there, just real balanced, and she'll read a page, and I'll read a page. And she'll read a page, and I'll read a page. If you talk to her on your way out, though, you'll find out we didn't read a chapter last night because we did, we did a different thing. And when it was 11 o'clock, she's like, can we read our chapter? I'm like, sweetie, it's too late. Ah, oh. Because she looks forward to that. <coughs> time with mom. That's quality time. Time with mom doing something that mom and me do. Dad and her don't do it. Her brother and her don't do it. Mom and her do it. That doesn't, that's not real intense, is it? Quality time doesn't have to be huge. It can be little things. Sitting in the bathroom while your toddler takes a bubble bath, but you're right there with them. Maybe you're sitting on the floor splashing in the water. <laughs> I suppose you could get in if you want. <laughs> but just being there at their level, that's quality time for kids. Okay? We're not distracted. I'm focused on you when I'm spending quality time with you. Okay? That's why we have to be careful about cell phones. Because I find my quality time with you and my cell phone does not exist. Because <laughs> I'm more focused on the person on the other end of my text message than I am in the person that's sitting in the room, maybe across from me. Okay? We've got to put those away for quality time. Quality time is not about problem solving. And sometimes we as the leadership want to take our quality time and start working on some of the issues that have to be there. But we as leadership in the family need quality time too. If we cannot stay connected for what our goals are and why we established this family and continue to enjoy and have fun with each other, we will not last. Couples need quality time. It renews, it revives, it energizes. It is a positive charge. Okay? So this is time set aside where it's about you and me. There are multiple levels of quality time in families. You've heard me talk about one where it's mono a mono with parent to child. Every child wants mono to mono with each parent. <laughs> so multiply that by how many children you got. <laughs> if you're a step parent, whew, you have to establish a relationship with a child that's not yours. Mono a mono, expect resistance. I'll tell you right up front. They want nothing to do with you. My stepdaughter moved in with me at 17 and a half. She wanted nothing to do with me. And I knew I wasn't mom. Whew. Okay, I had to look at her and say, how do we do this? What can we do so that we can be friends? I'm not mom. I'm an adult woman when I'm a step parent. How can we do this? Okay, so you got to know your role. Couples need it. Each kid wants it with each parent. Is there such a thing as family quality time? Absolutely. Absolutely. Sometimes family quality time is eating a meal together. We did that in my family growing up. In my current family, we um, do movie night. And movie night is where we pick a movie and we know we're going to have popcorn and we've decided what we're going to eat and you can put the, you can, you can dirty up the living room, we put the blanket down, you know, and it's, it's just us. The neighbor kids like to come to quality, to family night at my house because we, we do enjoy each other. And so sometimes the friends want to come. Sometimes they get an invite, but sometimes they don't. I've had kids sitting on my front stoop crying because they didn't get an invite to family night. I have to look at them and say, and this is the adult doing it. I don't send my children to do it. You know, tonight just needs to be the Palais family. Mom, dad, and our two kids. 
and we're not having anybody in tonight, and it's not you, you know, I'll consider it for next week. Okay, and when I tell a child that, who, who wants to be there because they like being with us, next week comes and I have to go back and tell them, okay, you know, check and see if you can come this week. But we do go back and do that. Okay, quality time is about family. How does the family stay connected? And so this is about us focused on us. Okay, multiple levels. It doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be huge. And it doesn't have to be every day. Doesn't have to be every day. I look at Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt with their six kids traveling around the world, and I'm thinking, now what does quality time look like there? Mm -hmm. I hear little snippets because I don't know them, but I just kind of watch because I'm like, that has got to be difficult. And occasionally you'll read or hear a little snippet of something, and I, I think, well, that would be, I would consider that quality time with that child or with that thing. We got to be doing the same things, even though, you know, I'm not a jet setter. I live in Tampa all the time. <laughs> okay. And then finally, problem solving. There are two questions to be answered about problem solving. You have to know what type of ways that you respond to the problems that are out there. Okay? Three types of problems are those that you can solve, those that you can improve but not solve, those that cannot be solved. Those that can be solved are those things you have control over. Those things you have control over. Okay, so you as leadership in the family can solve the problem about the things that aren't happening that need to be happening because you need to be putting the rules into place. You can solve the problem about I think I need to lose 10 pounds because that's your problem to solve when I need to lose weight. When I'm not exercising enough, that's my problem to solve, isn't it? Yes, okay. When I'm not happy at my job, that's my problem to solve, isn't it? Doesn't mean I won't take input on that one. But it's my problem to solve. Those problems that can be improved but not solved means that I am not the only one involved in that problem. Okay? So if you and I have a discrepancy about when we think the kids go to bed, that one's not going to be solvable because you and I have to work our way through that. If I have a co-parent, we're not together anymore, and you want to put the children to bed at 10 o'clock when, when they're over at your house, and I put them to bed at 8 o'clock at my house, I can talk to you about that problem, but I can't solve it over at your house without invading your space. Okay, when we are together, we're going to have to come to some conflict, but I'll find that if I'm gone one evening, like I work one evening <coughs> a week, and the, ch and the kids aren't always ready for bed when I get home, although they are ready for bed at that time when I'm there because we parent differently. It's, a, it's something that is, can be improved, but not necessarily solved. With case managers, you've got stuff that you can impact, that you can improve, but you can't solve. You come to your class every week, and guess what? You're working on some goal, aren't you? There are things there you can work on, but you can't fix it. You can't solve it all by yourself. There are some things that you cannot solve, and those, that means that it's probably not your problem. Somebody else actually has control over that item, okay? Like that I think you should quit smoking. I can pressure you to quit smoking, but until you're ready to quit smoking, you're not going to quit smoking. That's not my problem to solve, is it? Nope. Okay? So a lot of those can't be solved things are because they're not mine to solve. So if I'm trying to solve one of those, it's like running into the door without opening it. How long, will it be, how long will it take you to get through the door? Long, long time. Keep banging your head, you're going to have a bruise, you're going to wear yourself out, because it's not your problem to solve. You're banging your head on a wall. Let go of it. Easier said than done, isn't it? Karen, yes. Okay, so those are the three types of problems. Look at the problems that are there. Is this one I need to work with my, my co-parent with? Is this a problem that's mine to solve? Is this something I need to hear the child on, but I've got to make a decision about it? Okay, three types of responses. We can be um, expressed. We can get angry about it, yell and scream. We can be passive, we do nothing. We can be assertive. I listen, I try to understand, I'm focusing on what is the problem I'm trying to solve and how do we solve this with you. 
Okay, those are the three types of responses that are there. Okay, so those are the characteristics of how to be in an emotionally healthy family. And as you can see, there's a range to this. There really is no right or wrong way for a family to be as long as we agree about how we're going to set it up and how it's going to run. Okay? There are no right or wrong ways to do this. If you look at the four R's, you get those organized and you are well on your way to not having a lot of conflict. You may still have to work on balance. You may still have to work on quality time because I find people don't spend quality time when they're out of balance. They spend more time on chores and the, th the three C's.